I'm telling you, time and time again, I've been trying to record this video. It's very basic, very beginner level, learn how to read code. I'm literally just going over, what do I have here? Variables and expressions, functions, printing, conditional statements, and loops. That's it, just like on the base level. Don't really wanna get into too much object-oriented programming stuff. Probably doesn't help that I'm coming over here and trying to hop on into my artificial intelligence uh, Sokoban solver application that I built a while ago because it's probably not the best example. The code here may be a little bit advanced, but there are a few basics. I mean, you know, you hold, carry the basics to a little bit more advanced. So what I'm gonna try to do, not fall down a rabbit hole when talking about simple variables or simple expressions or simple functions. I'm gonna try to make this as simple as possible. If you want me to dive in a little bit more about object-oriented programming in a future video, let me know in the comment section below. If you want me to dive into what I've done here with some of my artificial intelligence applications, let me know, let me know in the comment below. But for now, I want this to be very simple, very basic, because that is gonna have, that, that's how you start out. The thing is, I remember when I was first starting out, and I felt like nobody who actually knew how to code realized how to communicate with someone who has no idea how to code. I feel like they always thought that I should have a, a certain, a certain level of understanding in the way they were talking to me, because they would talk about things, I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I've taken two classes on programming, and by two classes, I mean, to one hour classes, not two semesters worth of programming. Let's uh, let's let's take a step back so we, I can actually understand what in the world you're talking about. So that's what this video is going to try to accomplish. I'm going to try to give you some of the lingo that goes, goes on here. That way when people are talking about parameters and functions or methods and variables, you know exactly what they're talking about because that is exactly what I needed when I first started coding because I felt like it was a little while before I actually understood the lingo in which you know people, people use when talking about code. So in this video, we're going to learn how to read code I'm gonna be hopping in from this uh, Hangman C++ application that I wrote a while ago. I helped write a while ago, probably four, five years ago. It does have a few object-oriented programming principles in there, but we'll see what we can do to go over the basics. And I am gonna be hopping into a little bit of Java. This is very basic expressions and whatnot. And when it comes to data types, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about Java. The thing is, when it comes to the basics, from programming language to programming language, it ought to be for the most part the same. There are some synonymous words that one programming may call like a function, another programming language like Java may call a method, C++ you may have both, it depends on how they're used, but just get a basic understanding, of, and that's the rabbit holes that I've been falling down when I'm trying to make this video prior. So without further ado, let's just hop on into this and see how we can do. Okay, maybe just one more ado, and that's to let you know that the sponsor of this video, Skillshare, is giving you two months of Skillshare Premium for free when using the link in the top of the description. And at the end of this video, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how some of their courses helped me create the logo for my new business that I'll be launching on January 6th. All right, first things first, variables. So when it comes to variables, what are variables? You can think of variables or something that you create or you declare that is effectively a box that holds a value. So what you see right here, this is a variable of length. This is you declaring the variable, and this is you assigning the value of one to this variable. We don't have to do all of this on one. Let's take it simple, step by step. This is your variable type, or also known as a data type. And this right here is your variable name. You determine what the variable name is. When it comes to the data type, those are reserved words. So whatever you want to, uh, the variable to be, what data type you want it to be, you have to make sure you follow the code. But when it comes to the variable name, that is the name you give it, so it makes sense in the context of the code. So if somebody else comes in and wants to read your code, they understand exactly what you're talking about. You come in six months from now, it's basically like someone else coming in and reading your code, so you know what you were talking about six months prior. And with this, this, va this variable right here is gonna store the value of the word length. Like I said, this is a hangman application. So what do you do when you set up hangman? Well, you draw your little, little hangman thing, and then you have underscores. Let's say our word is coffee. You have six underscores for C-O-F-F-E. E. You putting all of those underscores there, that is you telling the person you're playing against the length of the word, so that is what we're doing here. As a matter of fact, let's just run this so I can show you a little bit better. All right, so this is how it is. Basically, when it asks you how long is your word, you're gonna be typing in a value that is then getting stored within length. This isn't always the case. Like before, what you saw us doing is we were assigning one to the value of length, and when we type in here, we're going to be overriding the one, and now length will be whatever we type in here. But let's take a step back. Let's go back into the variable type. So right here, variable name, this is the length, like I said, 
But if it was price, then you would name it price. If you want to be more specific, you can name it word length. Well, you, could, you should probably spell it right. And all of these would be word length as well because this is when you're referencing or calling your variable. And this is proper syntax, uh, how you go about naming a variable. Lowercase with the first word in your variable name, uppercase for every other word in your variable name, but you probably already know that. I'm trying not to assume that you know anything, but that's something that you probably already know. And now back over to the variable type. So this particular instance, it is int length. So we are saying that length is going to be storing an int, which is also short for integer. If we come on over here, mind you, yes, this is C++ code. This is Java data types, but the idea is still the same. I just like this little graph that they have right here. So what you'll find right here is int. This is what length is. But you also see under integer, you have byte, short, int, and long. Typically, you're gonna be using int, but the thing is with int, that stores values all the way up from 2.1 some odd billion all the way down to negative 2.1 some odd billion. So if you know your value is going to be larger than that, you would use long. I mean, you can see it right here in this table. This is your data type, byte, short, int, long, just like we have right here, all integers. And the default size is one byte, two byte, four byte, eight byte, respectively. But the variables don't only store integers. What if you need to have a decimal that is when this comes into play. And same idea, float and double the difference is float is a four byte and the default size of double is eight byte. However, variables don't only store number values, they also store letters. For a letter, you would use char. So we're right up here, if we wanted length to actually represent a letter, we will do char and we could do char equals A, let's not forget. And that is the same idea when it comes to char, that is your variable type, length, we could rename this letter A equals A. So whenever you use this variable, it'll be an A, but that's not what the hangman does. So let's go back. So I know that may have been a lot of information I just threw at you. Just know when you're reading uh, your variables that you have declared or someone else has declared, variables that are declared in the code base, let's just say that, this is your variable type. This represents what type of value is going to be stored in the variable and this is your variable name that you determined all based on the context of your code to make sure it all makes sense. Now let's move on over to expressions. We're gonna hop on over to this Java file, have a few basic expressions going on right here. What are expressions? Expressions are a combination of values and operators to create a new value. So right here, this is a variable. We have declared the variable X and we have assigned it to. That's not an expression. That is your variable declaration and assignment. In semicolon, that's the end of a statement. So we know that x is of type int, and now that x equals two. So how are you gonna read this? You're gonna read two times three, that equals six. So we know that x right now equals two. We know that y equals six, and that is the expression right here, x times three, in order to create a new value of six to store in y. Same idea, but with division, so six, now that we know that y is equal to six, six divided by two, that equals three, which means that three is stored in z. Now, this one's a little bit different. As you see, we have already declared and assigned a value to x. So we don't have to redeclare it like this. We actually can't redeclare it like that. We're just reusing x and we're gonna be assigning it a new value. Don't read this like an algebraic equation. Just because x equals two right now, like right up here, doesn't mean that this equals two. Whatever this equals, we're going to be overriding the two that the x represents or that the x is, is storing with whatever the value is of this uh, expression. So just like regular math, parentheses first, two plus z, so two plus three, that would equal five, module two. So module, that means the value is the remainder of your division. So five divided by two, that is two remainder one. So that remainder of one is the value of this expression, meaning we're assigning, or we're gonna be storing one in X. So if we were to come down here and do int A equals, I don't know, let's do X plus Y. It's yelling at us because we don't use A anywhere else in the code base, whereas up here we used X, Y, and Z, X, Y, and Z in the code. That's the reason for this little yellow squiggly, but that's neither here nor there. This is an expression X plus Y. Now try to do this expression real quick while I'm talking about it. You may obviously see that X right now in this part of the code, it equals one, it doesn't equal two. So one plus Y, Y still equals three equals four. So we know that A equals four. That was just a little example to show you that you can reassign values to the variables that you have already declared. Cool. So we've gone over variables, gone over expressions. Now let's go over 
printing. Printing is not really fun one for me, simply because I don't ever use printing as it sits, uh, unless I'm trying to like debug code in like a hard coding type of way. But if you wanna just briefly look over uh, printing, this is how you print out in Java. System.out.println, open parenthesis, open quotation, hello Java, and then you close those, you end the statement with a semicolon, and this is just gonna print out hello Java. I mean, we can run this right now if we really wanted to. See right here, it printed out hello Java. If you're wondering why it didn't do any of this, that's because we didn't tell it to print out. It actually did this, but we didn't tell it to print out anything. Like if we wanted to, we could come here. We could tell it to print out X. As a matter of fact, X equals plus X. I think that's how it goes, if I recall correctly. So if we were to run this code, we have the hello Java from this line right up here. And we just did system.out.println. Mind you, you can also do print. I'll get to that in a sec. So system.out.println, X equals the value of X. So X equals one. Because remember at this point in the code, it equals one. However, we were to take this, we were to come right on up here, just under this X. This actually is a really good example of how to show you how this goes about. We'll run this code. Right up here, we want to print out hello Java. Okay, we print out hello Java. X equals two, because we did right here, X equals, and then we printed out the value of X. But under here, we reassign this X to equal one via this expression. So now when we do the same exact statement as we have right up here, the print statement, X equals one for the reasons I've already laid out. And if you're wondering what that was before, if we take print lin means that you print this out and then you start a new line. If you were to take out print lin or the lin rather, and you were to run it just like this, this would happen. Hello Java X equals two. That is because we're not creating a new line character. This printed out and it stayed right here. There are other different variations, like you could do new line like this if we wanted to. That also represents a new line. So if we run it, we see that hello Java new line X equals two. That is because we have this even though we don't have the lin. And there are also different other ways to go about it. Like print F is something that you may want to look into. That The F stands for formatting. That just depends on how you're going to go about formatting whatever you're printing out. But you get the gist. I mean, all of y'all have probably already done this. If you're into Java or into any other language, you've already printed out hello world. However, in C++, it's a little bit different. This is a print statement right here. Obviously, you see that we have new lines and you can actually see what we have right here. Let's play hangman. Let's play hangman. Two new lines, so new line, new line. Please think of a word from four to nine characters long. The word, new line. Please think of a word, so and so, so the word, new line. And then this, you're effectively just exiting your C out statement. And that is how printing works in C++. Now let's go over functions. So functions in Java are known as methods. In C, they're only known as functions. In C++, functions and methods all depend on whether or not you're inside a class. But regardless, let's just, let's just call this a function. Remember, just know function or method. If you talk with somebody, it's probably gonna be synonymous. I never correct anybody if they call a method a function or a function a method. If they say function in Java, I'm not gonna be like, well, technically that's a method. Whatever, I know what they're talking about. This right here, whoops, this right here, that is a function. This is a function type of int, similar to our variable type. This is the function name that you gave it. So whenever we run our hangman application, we have an initial prompt that is this, AKA this, which this is the function body, and then this, this is your parameter list. In this particular instance, we don't have any parameters, but if you were to have parameters, that is where they would go. And it, would, it could look something like this. Uh, like that. That is your parameter list. You're passing in parameter X, you're passing in parameter Y. But let's just run through this function. And when running through this function, we will also be going through this while loop and this if statement. This is a loop. You've probably heard of a for loop. You've probably heard of a while loop, but we'll go over exactly how to go about reading it. And then this is an if statement, also known as a conditional statement. You also may have heard of a switch case statement. And remember, this is all C++. But the principles are the same. Even the syntax is typically the same. All right, so we printed out all of this, which is all of this right here. We have declared our variable, and before we had it assigned the value of one. Now the reason we have this assign the value of one right here, length equals one, is because we wanna hop on into this while loop. The conditions for this while loop are while length is less than four or the double pipe means or length is greater than nine, I want you to do this. This is a while, the loop body. So the thing is, as long as one of these is true, 
This is just gonna be going and going and going and going and going and going until both of these are not true. If you wanted to do and, this is how you would do and, but we don't wanna do and, we wanna do y, uh, or. So the reason we assigned a length to equal one is so we could hop into here because length equals one, well, one is less than four. So let's hop on into the while loop. See so yeah, how long is your word? Oh, look, it's already printed out because we had already assigned this, we ran it, boom. And then C in, so this is your output stream, C out, System out print line. That is your output stream. C in in C++. That represents your input stream. So right here, you can see we can type in something. And that is going to be a word from 49 characters long. We're typing in the length of that word we have. So coffee, well, let's, let's do it wrong real quick. It needs to be between 49 characters long, right? Well, let's say our... our word is 10 letters long. Well, it reprompted us. That is because obviously we didn't fulfill the uh, uh, the proper parameters. Therefore, it, we are staying within this while loop and actually threw us into this if statement. And for this if statement, this is the conditional expression. And these just so happen to be the same because as long as you have not fulfilled your duty of choosing a word that is between four and nine characters long, Keep on doing this. So if you put in 10, like we did, let's do this, which is the then clause, because if this is true, then do this, else do some code. The reason we don't have an else is because if this is not true, we don't care about any of this. We just wanted to skip over the if statement. However, if this is true, then we wanted to do this, but if it wasn't true and you wanted it to do something, that's when you would write this code. And then when we finally exit this while loop, actually, we're still in the while loop. So 10, I've restarted the application, if you were wondering. So if we did 10, as we know, this happened, and then it threw us back up into this, because while this is true, continue to do the while loop body. Now we're gonna say, all right, coffee is our word, so that is six letters. Boom, we're now out of the while loop because when it tried to test it back up again, the length was not less than four and the length was not greater than nine. Therefore, we're good to go. We returned the length value, which started off as value one. Then we made it value 10. Then we made it value six. And what this return statement does is we're returning the value of length to be stored into this function. So every time this function is called, it does all of this work in order to get the value of length to be returned and stored in initial prompt, hence why length is an integer and initial prompt is also an int. Okay, that actually took us over this particular function. This is a function body every time this is called, like over here, we're calling initial prompt. So whenever we call initial prompt, all of this happens. All of this happens, which that's the same thing. I just want to show you visually. And then once we determine that, okay, how long is your word six? We return the value of six that is stored in length to be stored within initial prompt. And right here, what is happening? As you know, this is us declaring the int word size. And since we just stored six within initial prompt when this was called, you could probably take a guess at what this is doing. Take a quick second, take a guess. We created the variable word size of type int in order to store the value of initial prompt, which is six. So this right here is saying, okay, word size equals six. You see how all of this works together, how the functions work together with the variables and the variables work within and outside of the function. Understanding how all of these are intertwined, that is my main goal. That way you can look at some code and understand. However, what if you didn't read initial prompt before you came here? You just came to the main application, you say, okay, this is your main function. Remember, these are parameters that are being passed into it. And then you have, boom, int word size equals initial prompt. Well. You can control click on initial prompt. It'll take you to where the function initial prompt is being created. And now you understand, okay, this is exactly what it's doing right here. The reason we put it all in a function is so that every time you use initial prompt, you don't have to type this all out again and again and again and again. All right, so we've gone over variables. We've gone over expressions. We've gone over print and print statements. We've said, okay, semicolon, that marks the end of a statement. That one's very important. You don't wanna be uh, having an amazing code and it not work because you forgot a semicolon. Been there, done that. We've gone over while loops. We have gone over if statements. However, we have not gone over for loops or switch case statements, which that is indeed something I wanted to go over in this video. All right, for loop. All right, within the for loop, we're gonna have to break it up a little bit. This right here, remember, the semicolon is the end of a statement. So this statement right here 
is its own statement in and of itself. This is the initialization statement. This is your conditional expression, and this is your increment statement. So remember, conditional expression, where else have you heard that? Well, when you have your while loop, let's go back to the original one, your while loop, this is the conditional expression. So while this or this is true, do this. Same thing right here, this is your conditional expression. While this or this is true, do this. So, same idea with the for loop. It's effectively while this is true, do this. So let's take you through exactly what's going on in this for loop. Obviously we know our variable, variable type, our variable name, which in a for loop is typically i, equals one. This is you assigning the value of one to i. i is less than or equal to word so far dot size. What I've deducted from here is that this is the size of your word, or in other words, the length of your word that we determined right here, so six. And the way I figured that out is that word so far is these six dots right here. This is a word so far. So for example, if you were to already guess C, C would be right here, and then you would have these five blanks afterwards. If you did F, it would be C blank F F E uh, blank blank, and that would be your word so far. And this right here, this is six places, because we told it the length is going to be six. This is six places, so we are getting the size of the string word so far. This is a parameter that's being passed into here. So the string word so far, how big is it? So in this particular instance, it'll get the size of the word, which is six digits. So the value would equal six. That is how I deducted that this right here equals six. So one is less than or equal to six. And then we're gonna come on into the loop body and do exactly what it says. So this loop body, it's simply saying print out the value of i, and that is how you get one right here because i equals one. And then once you're done with the loop body, that is when this increment statement comes into play, and this is effectively i equals i plus one, so i equals one plus one, which that would be two. So two less than or equal to six, that is true, so we're going to be printing out i, which now equals two, and that's how you get this two. And it's going to keep on going until this conditional expression is no longer true. So once it hits six, we print out the six, we increment it, so i equals six plus one, so i equals seven. Seven less than or equal to six, well that's not true, so we're done with the for, uh, for loop. And that's for loops in a nutshell. Now let's go on, go on over to a switch case statement, which I do not have in my code. I checked earlier. So we're gonna come on over here. So this is a basic uh, syntax when it comes to C, well, when it comes to effectively any language, C++, C, Java, you have your switch. So this is switch case statement. You have your switch, you have your parameter. This is, this is your value in which you're passing into your switch statement, and this lays it out very well. If n equals one, you're gonna be going with case one. If n equals two, you're gonna be going with case two. If n equals three, uh, well, there is no case uh, case three, so you're just gonna to go to default. So if n doesn't equal one or two, equals anything else, any other value, it's just gonna to go to the default. So let's take a better look. Let's do C++ since that's what we've been doing. So right here, we have our main function, and within this, we have our parameterized computation also known as our function body. We have our variable type. We have declared our variable of x in type int, so we know it's gonna store an integer value. And we're assigning x the value of two, so now, okay, x equals two. Okay, so switch two, so we're passing in the value of x, which is two, so we're gonna be going to case two, so now we're gonna do whatever code is within our case two, and that is print out choice is two. I mean, you can see right down here, actually, choice is two. However, if x equaled one, we would do whatever code is within case one right here. If it was case three, then we would do whatever code is within case three. If it was anything other than one, two, or three, then we would do default. So case, you know, you can count up in cases all the way to, I guess, whatever you really want to. And as long as the value is equal to one of those cases, it'll do that case, whatever code you put into that case. If it equals anything else, it's just going to go to the default that you determined and do whatever code you put in there. And that is a switch case statement in a nutshell. I've gone over everything I wanted to. I don't think I fell down any rabbit holes. Maybe I didn't even put as much information into some of these as I may should have like I did when I went down the rabbit holes in my previous takes, but that's neither here nor there. I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a big thumbs up. If you want to see more like this, like I said, if you want to see you know, some object-oriented programming, how to go about reading that and drilling in from one function to another function or one method to another method and just kind of how it goes about, 
let me know in the comment section below. If you want me to go over some of these uh, artificial intelligence programs that I have right here, let me know that as well. And it's kind of a setting that Git, GitHub finally caught on to the fact that I am no longer a student, so that sucks. But you know what doesn't suck? The sponsor of this video, Skillshare. So I know many of y'all already know what Skillshare is by now. So before I even talk about exactly what Skillshare is all about, let me just say you can get two months of Skillshare Premium for free when using the link in the top of the description. Click on the link, two months of Skillshare Premium for free, you're good to go. Now what are you gonna get with that two months of Skillshare Premium for free? Well, you're able to get access to tens of thousands of courses that Skillshare has to offer. I personally used them in my logo design. I'm going to be launching a company here on January 6th. And I think I actually showed y'all last video, the guy that actually was teaching that course because he was awesome. This guy right here, Aaron Draplin. Just wait for it. Wait for it. Hello, Skillshare students, enthusiasts, and hungry minds. My name is Aaron James Draplin. I'm 40 years old. I'm a graphic designer here in Portland, Oregon at Field Notes Northwest headquarters, of course. Thank you for coming and being a part of this. And um, he has quite a few different courses as well. Obviously his profession is logo design, so he has customizing type with Draplin, so customized uh, typeface. You have logo design, circular logo design, illustration with Draplin, design like Draplin. So if any of that piques your interest, you can do it all for free if you really wanted to. This is one and a half hours, this is one hour and seven minutes, one hour and two minutes, two hours and nine minutes, two hours and 11 minutes. And if you're really dedicated, oh, what is that, 12 minutes? Designer and a fan on tour with Aaron Draplin. I'm, I'm about to watch this after I get done with this video. This is a Skillshare exclusive documentary. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna watch that. But just know there's so many different instructors in any of these topics, business analytics, freelance and entrepreneurship. Maybe you wanna go into web development, UI, UX design. I know that these two will definitely perk some of y'all's interest. So, hey, it's worth checking out. It's free, two months. Hope you like it. And remember, keep a lookout. January 6th, business launch. It's only been a year in the making. So I uh, hope y'all enjoyed this video. I already gave you the whole spiel about the likes and the, and the, and the stuff like that. So I'll see y'all in the next one.